Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Honor the Feminine podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Ledford, and I am really excited to have Lola Medicine Keeper with us today. We are in for a ride, my friends. So as you know, we start each episode with an image and story from my travels, because when I was traveling is when I really started to hear the whispers of my intuition again. And I know she was always there, but she'd just gotten muffled in the day-to-day chaos and noise. And it was beautiful to start to hear her again and start and start to commune with her anew. So today, our image is called Dragon, and it was taken in Kuching in Malaysian Borneo. The dragon can be seen at the Chinese temple in downtown Kuching. Hours can be spent exploring all the detail in the decorations that adorn the walls of the open-air sanctuary. Chinese temples serve as a refuge from the stream of traffic and constant motion of the city. The people of Kuching come and go, offering prayers and lighting incense. In Chinese mythology, the dragon represents the vital potential of falling rain and flowing water. Life is a process of constant growth, and learning to go with the flow creates some ease within the experience. Dragons have been very present for me recently again. So this is the image that reminds me of our guest today, Lola Medicine Keeper. Lola, welcome. Thank you so much to have for having me, and I'm honored to remind you of a dragon. Yeah. Me too. Fierce (laughs) and loving. Um, (laughs) All right. So share yourself with us. Tell us about you. Yeah. So I am fierce and loving, (laughs) but I wasn't always fierce. I am a recovering people pleaser and perfectionist. I escaped from the corporate life about seven years ago now and have been an entrepreneur in various fashions since then. Um, But I've had to become fierce in breaking up with the life I thought I should have Mm -hmm. and stepping into the life that was and is truly mine. And that life has asked me to expand into all kinds of unknown territories. My work has constantly pulled at my comfort zone and made me expand far, far past it. I do things like lead shamanic medicine retreats in the jungles of Peru now and at the same time teach soulful marketing and, you know, it's just this wild journey that I've been on and um, the state of flow that Dragon represents is for sure one of my greatest allies um, because if we don't have those refuges from the demands of modern life, then we burn out, we get sick, uh, we get depressed. We look like I did before I did this for myself, which was maybe pretty and shiny on the outside, maybe, but deeply wounded on the inside. Mm. And it's been a journey to um, not only wear those wounds on the outside, but fill them with gold and stand tall in authenticity. Gosh, I can just so resonate with that, especially this idea of my life looking really perfect from the outside, you know, corporate lawyer in Manhattan, doing well financially, coming from this little farm town in California, right? And I was dying. My soul was getting sucked away. Yeah. And it's like, we don't even know that that's the issue at first. I mean, I didn't know that was the issue. Right. I just felt like uh, I'm going to try everything in my power to change whatever it seems to be and see if that helps. So maybe it's quitting my job. Maybe it's having a baby. Maybe it's losing weight. Maybe it's becoming blonde. Maybe it's opening my relationship. Maybe I'm a lesbian. I mean, all these things, I really 
I really dismantled every single assumption and choice that I had made in my life Mm. and still felt this despair. And then I knew I had to look at the much bigger choices I had made and start to dismantle those. And um, that's why I look at life now as a shamanic initiation, knowing what I know about shamanism and how much we're asked to lay down on the pyre in order to stand in truth. And so can you talk to us about those first few steps onto a shamanic journey and what that looked like for you? Yeah, it was really unexpected, first of all. (laughs) Um, Although when I look back and see my childhood patterns, it's obvious that this is who I am. Um, But it wasn't obvious to me until I started to get these symbols and calls. And one was a girlfriend mentioning to me the medicine of ayahuasca um, about seven years ago before I left my first marriage, my practice marriage, as I like to call it. And it was something that immediately like caused this little zing in my system. But I didn't know how to spell it. I didn't know how to find out about it. Um, I just knew that it was kind of a marker that I would come back to later. Um, So I got these little kind of zings of energy and hints, whispers. Then I met my future husband, Tigre, who was moving to Peru. And as we started to date, I started to have this Peruvian shamanism come onto my radar more and more and more. At the same time as starting to be able to, strangely enough, sense people's power animals. And that's why my husband is now named Tigre. It's because I saw a tiger in him and he was like, what? What are you talking about? I'm not a tiger. No, no, no. And I was like, well, this is how spirit animals work. Like you don't, you don't immediately usually resonate with them. Maybe if you're lucky, but oftentimes it's this sense of um, abandoned power within the self that's coming back to you. So of course it doesn't feel like home it feels, you know, strange and threatening. So, um, I started to see people's animals and just feel them. It started with the men I was dating. It was like, ooh, this is kind of a, almost right, it's a panther. You know, it's kind of like seductive and mysterious, but I need someone who's a little bit more willing to show up. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> right. And so I met Tiger and I was like, oh, there's some bold stripes. <laughs> yeah, you're showing up. Like in the animal world, you might be camouflaged, but here you're quite visible. And... Um, really willing to show up. And so I didn't know what all these things meant quite yet, but I started to really just dive full in because I had learned by this point that whatever resonates is something I need to explore Mm -hmm. and not ignore. And yeah. (laughs) That's something I talk about here on the podcast all the time. If you hear something that resonates, if you get the zing, Please, please, I invite you to step into that a little further. Yes. Just And just lean in. You don't have to dive into the deep end the way I do sometimes. You don't <laughs> but, have to go all the way. Yeah. No, you don't have to go all the way in that first moment. But yeah, start to lean in because there's something there. There's magic there. That's yeah. what's there. This is all the magic. That I mean, that's yeah. all this is. And... That magic is yours by divine right. It's mine by divine right. If you're listening to this, it's yours by divine right. That's right. Nobody told me I could feel spirit animals. I did not get a certification from some agency or approval from a shaman in Peru. Um, It just is. I, I couldn't turn it off, you know. And so... I started to just explore it playfully because I was working with Fox Medicine at the time. And so play (laughs) was the name of the game. So I started to just play around with this idea of what is our power animal and what is the difference between a power animal and a spirit animal and a totem and how do I make sense of this for myself, you know? And so I looked into other schools of thought about it and really didn't find much that resonated So I was a bit in the dark, you know, it was like, okay, well, I'm just going to kind of have to do this on my own. And soon friends and family heard about what I was playing around with. And they were like, well, what am I? And so I'd feel into it and explain to them what I saw and why. And everybody was like, oh, my God, this is a real thing. Like, I thought you were joking, you know. (laughs) 
And I was like, yeah, I'm not joking. It might, might seem fun. It is. But, you know, it's going to surprise you with something meaningful and true. And this developed pretty organically into an offering. And that is when my work started to take a seriously shamanic twist. And it was a huge leap of faith because I had to trust the information that was coming through to me that I was sending to practical strangers or outright strangers on the internet at this point and just say, I'm leaving it in the hands of the divine that whatever is going to be medicine for these people lands how it needs to, to be of benefit to them, you know, because I can't know if I'm right or wrong. There is no right or wrong with us. Yeah. Um, I can't know if I'm going to match whatever else they've been told or what they feel, but I can certainly see things from my perspective and that's of use. And believing that was a huge stretch. God, you know, it really gorgeous. like, it pulled it all out of me. And so, um, you know, I did that for a few years and also deepened into many other aspects of shamanic work. Most importantly, creating space in my life for devotion. Mm. You talk about that temple and I think that is why devotional practice and making space for spirit makes my modern life possible. I don't have room for abundance, right? Like I don't have room for true authentic connection with my family. I can't be the mom and wife and businesswoman and leader and teacher and guide that I am meant to be if I don't also have space for the sacred. I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels like when I get away from it some, because there's definitely an ebb and flow situation going on most sure. of the time. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it just gets like the day to day feels more like a struggle. Yep. And that when I'm in it, there can be more flow and it amazes me the magic that I'm attuned to and that's going on around me, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. It's like, why did I forget this again? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> but I think that's why we forget, you know, because we are human and we aren't designed to be robots and certainly not with a spiritual practice. Like, please no. Um, sometimes space for the sacred just means like noticing the color of the sky while I'm walking to get mail. You know, it doesn't mean I'm taking an hour out of my day to meditate. I did today. That was a first in very many months, you know, but um it's like we think that creating space for devotion means we have to like add something more to our very busy lives mm. or really it's just depth to our existing life and height to our existing life. So we're stretched this way, you know, vertically instead of horizontally where we're being pulled into a sheet of flimsy trying to hardness. <laughs> Yeah, at that point where it's like, oh, no, not one more thing for the ritual. And like, right. that's the energy around it. That's when I know, like, I need to take a step back. Yeah. And I've, I've started to really feel into like, wait, what's just up for right now? Like, what feels the most magical and alive right now for me? So yeah, if it's looking at the sky, or if it's walking the labyrinth right now, or if it's pulling an oracle card, whatever it is. Yeah. But it doesn't, it's about taking the time for me to feel into what it is versus being like, okay, so here's the ritual. And if I don't do it, I'm not in devotion. And I've been right. there too. <laughs> totally. I think it's part of the process of learning how to do this authentically, you know, and so we don't need all the tools. We don't need rote rituals and, you know, an opening and middle and end. We just need to cultivate presence and trust. And that's a journey. You know, it's not something I don't think we arrive at immediately when we decide this is important. You know, it's messy. <laughs> it's not linear. It's all over the place. It's so messy so often. So often. Please have it be messy because that's the whole point of being here, I think. Oh, then I'm doing such a great job. <laughs> You're a pro. <laughs> 
That's so good. Yeah, the um the ideas of surrender and trust have really been up in the last few months and man, that's messy. Oh man, it's hard. Like there's such nice platitudes when you say <laughs> You know, like I had this experience once in a medicine ceremony um, where I was like, I'm going to hold the intention of opening my heart. Like, that's going to be beautiful. (laughs) So I hold this intention and I take the medicine and very shortly I am shown all the ways I shut down my heart and I'm a total bitch. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? Like, this is not the pleasant experience that I was hoping for of like magical loving everyone. It was more like, Look at all the ways you're not loving anyone. Mm, isn't that painful? Yeah, why don't you feel that? <laughs> I can remember walking the labyrinth for the first time a few months ago, and I was calling in surrender and trust. And yes. do you know God is just, man, she laid it out that following week. Like, daughter has pink eye. I have the first <laughs> cold I've had in years where it lays me out. I mean... And the only thing I could do was surrender. Like, yeah. I had no choice. I got all of these beautiful opportunities to surrender. And I struggled, you know? Like, like it, I think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really amazing to imagine the act of surrendering when you're in this, like, orgasmic state of bliss. Like, oh, yes, please. Like, I will lay back and just receive. Mm-hmm. It's not as pleasant when you're puking on the floor at 3 in the morning. <laughs> You know, you're not sleeping, pink eye, yeah. she's crying, you're crying, like, it's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess. And that is the sacred human experience. You know, it really is. It's like, in those moments, if we can remember to like, have a little grace, have a little mm-hmm. faith, and um, step outside of personalizing it, like, it's not always about us, even if we're the ones experiencing it then it's going to be good. Then we can tolerate so much and not like grit our teeth and muscle through it, but just actually live the medicine of it. Yeah. And for me, there was that shift from why is this happening to me or happening to us into, oh, we're moving through some stuff. Exactly. And there's medicine here. Yeah. In all of that. Yeah. Perspective is everything. I mean, there's a a cliched phrase that is cliched because it's true, which is that life is not happening to you. It's happening for you. Mm. And I really continue to understand that truth at deeper and deeper levels the more I walk this path. And it helps give me great peace. It helps give me great peace when I am going through something painful when I'm feeling lost, when I'm feeling purposeless, which happens to me, like it happens to everyone. Um, in those moments I go, Oh yeah, might take me a minute to remember or a day or a week, but I can remember that I'm not just having this experience for me. It is so that I can show up better in my life of service. Mm. You know, if I'm this perfect pedestal dwelling queen, how am I of use really? You know, and how exhausting, <laughs> fucking terrible sounding. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Sorry for that little expletive. That is another fun part about being myself more and more. Is that, um, yeah, we welcome it all here, Lola. Come on, fabulous. <laughs> So can we go back to spirit animals? Can we circle back for just one second? Because sure. um, Lola has this gorgeous gorgeous podcast called Wild Playground. And she did an episode a few months ago around, are you my spirit animal? And I want to just, if you could speak into a little, because this was so profound for me, because... um. Spirit animals had been sort of bouncing on my periphery and I'd been like pushing them away because there'd been this idea that you have one. Oh, You're sort of locked into it. And um, I loved what you talked about because it so resonated with me around it's not one, it's what medicine from a particular spirit animal is up now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that there probably are a number of core 
animal guides for any particular person. I don't think that we have just one though, you know, because it is too limiting. We need multiplicity of perspective and facets of understanding in order to gain a a more holistic view of ourselves and our lives. And so how can we do that through the lens of one particular archetype? I don't think we can. Mm -hmm. So I look at spirit animals as if they are, you know, archetypes and they are. And so we need many of them in our kind of council. I almost think of like, we have this council of power animal elders that are pillars around us in the center of our, of our being. And any number of them can step forward at any given time and say, it's my turn to guide you right now. Mm. Uh, I'm going to be the most useful for what's happening in your life. So learn about me, relate to me, come to me, and I will help you see what you can't see through your human eyes and gain some perspective to help you navigate whatever time you're in. There's also such thing as an animal messenger, which is really of the moment. You know, it could be very, very fleeting. So you're walking down the street and an animal you've never thought of once and never had any sort of relationship with and don't have a strong resonance with suddenly makes a very strong appearance to you. Like, you know, a great blue heron flies smack dab in front of you and you're like, whoa, (laughs) like, oh my God, what animal (laughs) is that? And like, holy shit, you just called my attention. Animals that call to our attention are almost like our soul doing a Google search in the universe going, show me what I need to see. (laughs) And there they are, you know, like top one, number one result equals today, blue heron. So you better get yourself some information. (laughs) (laughs) What medicine are you working with right now? Like what spirit animal is up? Literally dragon, which is why it's hilarious to me that that's (laughs) the the carry. My listeners know that I got obsessed back a few months ago with dragon, like obsessed. Yeah. 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 I am working with that animal in depth right now. Um, And it's an animal spirit, even though it's at this point um, considered like a mythical creature, it's still very much an archetypal power totem. And um, I've been working with it as we work to manifest and concretize our retreat center land and home space and me learning to work with the power of the dragon has helped me step ever more into my personal power into a place of faith and knowing and also groundedness because if you think about how a dragon looks anatomically from like a viking or a celtic perspective which is my lineage um You've got like these really powerful legs and this big tail, and it's almost like you have this tripod where you're so much more balanced, you know, than trying to just be a two-legged. So I almost like rely on this proverbial spiritual dragon tail to keep me from getting swayed in all of the nuance and bullshit that goes with buying property. So it's kind of helped me like just kind of stabilize myself and also use that power for connecting with the spirit of the land and all the different shamanic things we're doing to facilitate this vision, which is a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All access points are welcome. (laughs) Correct, right? Like we're bringing in all the big guns right now, you know, because it's like we're this close and it's such a heart and soul um, dream, you know? So it's like, we have to really show up for that dream. We can't just visualize it and then be like, okay, yeah, maybe it'll happen. Like, pff, yeah, no. Um, we need to participate, I believe, in manifestation. Okay, so I'm going to share now because um, I'm working with Lola and Tigre right now in something that, they've, that they're calling tribal attraction, which is soulful marketing, and it's gorgeous. And... <laughs> My favorite line from last week's call together, which is posted noted in my office right now, is what fucks us up the most is not doing anything. And so what I just heard from you is like, how many ways in which you're showing your devotion to this? Yes. To all of life. You know, it asks a lot of us to be fully human because devotion also means there's room for heartbreak and disappointment. It means that we are open to hearing a no and not wanting that, you know, or hearing a yes that asks us to be really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And 
so devotion is not just a glib concept, you know, it's like heartbreaking open (laughs) and heartbreaking is part of it, you know? So being willing to lose because you have a calling for yes so strongly is I think my key to doing this well. And by well, I don't mean as a professional, I mean as a fully vulnerable, powerful woman. I want to take this moment for a sacred pause. And if you're listening near the time of this air date, September 27th, I want to invite you to join me for 11 Days of Devotion to Divine Union, a free video series where we dive into Divine Union with some really amazing guests, including Lola and her husband Tigray, who spoke so beautifully into presence making the heart grow fonder. It's a really potent activation. All of these interviews will be available for free through October 6, 2017. Again, these are all just really potent activations that have been so fun to bring to you. You can get access to these over at rememberingdivineunion.com. Just sign up with us there. All right, back to the show. I think that brings us beautifully to how do you honor the feminine and stay in touch with your intuition? so many ways. Um, But really, I think what the feminine and the intuition share is a deep desire to be heard Mm. and listened to and honored, right? The name of this podcast. So when my intuition speaks, my commitment to her is to listen. And not only to listen, to heed what I'm being shown or told, no matter how crazy or outlandish or illogical or way too logical. (laughs) Sometimes, you know, like there's no one flavor of intuition. It comes in all forms. And that's how I honor that side of my, my soul self and my higher self. And in so doing, I learn to soften my agenda, you know, and, (laughs) and trust which means I get to shape shift usually out of my expectations and into something totally mysterious and unguaranteed and absolutely correct. And this is how I embody the feminine. Um, and it's, I was talking to Tigre a couple of nights ago and I said, you know, the patriarchy and what's happening and has happened with that whole system of being is not because of men. It's because of the wounded masculine inside all of us. Yes. And so part of me honoring the feminine is also loving the masculine back into a state of health and holding that vision, you know, for my man, for all men, for all women to have that integration happen within them. Um, And that's a tough vision to hold sometimes because of how things have gone down and, um, you know, personal history with how the masculine tends to show up. But it's very healing to recognize that it's not the people that are the problem. It's this energetic within that has been so distorted. And so then we can realign to it. You know, we can heal that. That's the beauty is that we can heal it. Yeah. And we don't have to look outside of ourselves to do that. No, <laughs> like, we can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, and I think that's actually part of the shift that's going on. And part of the reason we've gotten so off track with the patriarchy and the wounded masculine is that We've been looking for this masculine and feminine outside of ourselves and the idealized notion of it in front of our eyes outside of us. Yes. And we've lost track of that divine feminine and sacred masculine energy lives within each of us, regardless of gender. Absolutely. And that where they intersect within us and we can play with them, those are actually power centers. 
And that's not about power over that the patriarchy no, no. has taught us. It's about enlivening our inner divine essence and power so that we can stand in it together. That's right. There's room for us all. All of us. And when we do that, we heal ourselves, we heal each other, and we heal the world. That's right. That's right. And that's what I've loved about having Tigray be more involved in Wild Playground and more balanced with me. You know, we're now both visible. We're now both working the magic. We're both really pulling our inner masculine and inner feminine together and weaving this into how we show up, what we create, and to see what happens when we feel and act integrated as individuals, as a couple, and just then what happens from that place is just, I mean, it's like incomprehensible. It's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. The more and more I work with it, the more and more I surrender over to it. Yeah. Oh my God. And, and there, and I, I can, I can feel that as amazing and on the edge of my comfort zone I've been and and my container widening and being more in my power, I've only scratched the surface. And you know what? That never ceases to be true. Fascinating. (laughs) It is. And it's also like, oh, good. Because if I can hold the tolerance for having so much more to go and so little that is known then I can do this and be this, you know, like I can do this and be this for as long as I am here because those edges will always continue to disappear into the horizon. Mm. It's like chasing a rainbow. Oh, that's beautiful. I hadn't thought about it like that. (laughs) It just came to me. (laughs) I love it. That's what happens when we drop into sacred space. That's Beautiful right. things come out. <laughs> <laughs> Will you speak into for just a moment around the soulful marketing and the idea of attraction? Yeah, it's pretty tricky. Um, first of all, because I think marketing as it has been employed in the past is really coming from that wounded masculine place of inducing fear to make a result happen um, Mm -hmm. and to make people feel inadequate to manipulate behavior. And in the way that I show up and the way that I desire to show people how they can show up is in this idea that the more you are yourself, the more you stand in your values, the more you are daring to reveal of your true nature. And there is an art to that for sure. But the more that you do that, the more magnetic you are to your right people and the less convincing you have to ever do, if ever. I've never sold a single thing since I stepped into my soul self and started working in this way. And so being magnetic also means that you are going to repel people. You're going to offend people. You may not attract a bunch of trolls and haters like people fear. I haven't had a whole lot of that. Thankfully, I probably will at some point, but Um, each time I have a little taste of that, it just builds up my strength and ability to kind of depersonalize the situation after initial hurt, of course. Um, but what happens is that your people feel a heart connection with you Mm -hmm. and your heart becomes your greatest financial ally, which is so backwards. Like we've turned money into this force of evil especially in spiritual and healing communities where it seems to be so hard to make a living. Uh, That's not a paradigm that has to exist. I am living a different paradigm. So I know it's possible. I'm not special. Not any more special than anyone else. You know, and if we're having this conversation, it means we're privileged enough to have this conversation, which which means we have an opportunity to use that privilege as a tool, right? And have a different idea of what it means to be in service, to be attractive, to be real, um, to be willing to be magnetic. That's something that really 
only emerged when I stopped trying to make everyone happy at the expense of myself usually. Yeah. And it's, I have found that so much of that is self-imposed. Like, oh, I, yeah. It's not, it's not really what anyone else is imposing on me. It's no, it wasn't me either. <laughs> yeah, like, my parents didn't do this to me. I came from a pretty darn healthy childhood, thankfully, so you know. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know where that came from. I had this drive to get straight A's and, like, all these just hard, rigid expectations of myself. Yeah. And expectations of what others expectations were of me you know which was like a pyramid scheme of you know, it's like any pyramid scheme is bullshit you know so I really had to deconstruct that and go okay well what happens when I stop trying to please everybody else start inquiring who I actually am and what she wants mm -hmm. and stand for that you know yeah it's funny about a year ago um because I also had this really beautiful, healthy childhood, you know? And I realized in my early 40s, about a year ago, that what would it feel like if my main motivation in life wasn't to make my father proud? Uh-huh. Yeah, right? And he hadn't imposed that on me, really. That was some self-imposed construct that I had structured. Like, Part of it's our soul contract and the dance in which he and I, the, the dance he and I do together and the lessons we're, and medicine we have for each other in this lifetime. I get that. But I don't have to continue to do the same dance over and over. Mm -mm. And as I shifted, our relationship is so much better and different. And it didn't actually require a lot of work with him. It required right? a lot of work of myself. <laughs> yes. And that is the key. You know, like that's what doing the work means. Like a lot of times we are looking for someone else to change in order for our relationship with them to change. Mm -hmm. And the relationship will change when we change our dynamic within it. Yeah. And then we can really see what's up. You know, before that, it's like, false dynamics interacting with each other. And when that kind of falls away, then you can see what there really is to work with and what's left, you know, and then you can build something real or leave feeling um, good about it, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating as you, as the mists start to clear around some of this stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, very clarifying, sometimes really hard information mm. too for people. Um, but, but usually, even when it's difficult, extremely empowering, you know, because it's like, then you're not pointing the finger at everyone else in your life for fucking you over or making it impossible for you to be yourself. Because the only one who's making it impossible for you to be yourself is you. Yeah, my suffering is created by me right? and the struggle <laughs> struggles <laughs> that right. I choose to continue to be in. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with struggle. You know, like I don't think we're supposed to transcend struggle. I think we're supposed to transcend our resistance to struggle and start to step into receptivity over what the struggle has for us. But I don't know that the struggle ever goes away. I think it's part of our evolutionary journey as a human being, yeah, you know? That makes sense to me. Yeah, it's definitely not about like, oh, all the struggle goes away and it's just <laughs> love and light, clean sailing, you know? Yeah, like, like maybe for like a week when you're in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Um, but I also believe that, yeah, the resistance and the way mine shows up is I, I go in kicking and screaming, you know? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, as I do a little less of that, <laughs> it's it's good for everyone. <laughs> it is. It's not that it's like um, easier. Mm -hmm. It's just in more flow. Yeah. You know, like there's less big boulders in the stream and things can just kind of move as they need to move when we're kind of getting out of the way of ourselves. Yeah, because it's definitely, again, it's not just love and light, because the mm -mm. darkness has, and the shadow, I've spent some time with that over the past year, too, and yeah, 
it's had so much medicine that I had been avoiding. Yeah, it usually has the best medicine for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why people are drawn to doing things like ayahuasca, because you dive into that shadowy, unknown space to see the things you can't see with your everyday eyes so that you become more integrated, whole and powerful. Mm. Otherwise, those things are sucking power from you. You don't even know it. So like looking for the monsters in the closet is actually the way we take back our power. Not by being like, oh, look, I have Archangel Michael next to me. That might be true also, yes, but what's going to bring you into a personal state of power is when you've seen the darkness and you go, if I've seen that and I'm here to tell about it, I'm a fucking badass. And no one can take that from you. Yeah. Beautiful. On that note, my love, are you ready for the random questions? Of course. (laughs) (laughs) So if you could sit down with a woman, alive or dead, for a chat and tea, who would it be? I definitely would adore an opportunity to sit and have tea or whatever whatever substance she would prefer (laughs) with Georgia O'Keeffe. Oh. Yeah, you're not drinking tea with her. It's so much No, <laughs> I don't think so. It's like bourbon or something. I don't know, but something good. <laughs> she's amazing. Somebody who I've long looked up to. Maybe she's one of my power animals. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> uh, and the second question is, where would you most like to travel? Ooh, um, this is a good question. I think right now... What is really calling, aside from Peru, where I'm already going in October, um, is to travel to upstate New York in the fall. I have always wanted to be a leaf chaser. (laughs) You know, I hate being a tourist, so I would hate that part. But there's something about those leaves. I named my my son Hudson after the Hudson River. (laughs) Because I have this love affair with autumn. (laughs) And in San Diego, autumn is pretty weak sauce. (laughs) So (laughs) non-existent. (laughs) Yeah, I would love to have autumn be something different than like 66 as a high, you know? (laughs) We actually, it's one of the things I love about living in Asheville is that we get that major leaf change. People come and chase the leaves Mm. and it's, there's something gorgeous about the, really feeling the seasons change in that way. <laughs> yes, there is. And like, what a lesson from nature in letting go and beauty on the way out, you know, like this flame of color as the chlorophyll leaves the leaves and they drop from the branches and then become soil. Like, that's how I want to live my life. I want to live it so that at the very end, I am like a red hot flame of beauty. And then I'm gone. Dude, I want to sign up for that. (laughs) I think you can. I think you are. I think you just did. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) So tell us if we want to deepen in with you, Lola, how do we reach out and connect with you? I would love to connect with all who resonate with my energy. Um, I really have such a heart-centered tribe, and my email is a temple space. So if you want to connect with me by email, I welcome just reaching out and saying, hi, I heard you on Shannon's podcast, and oh my gosh, hi. Um, (laughs) I get messages like that a lot, and it's really fun to get to know people. So you can email me at lola at wildplayground.com. My website is wildplayground.com and on social media, you'll find me everywhere as Wild Playground, me and my husband. He's much more front and center with me. So you'll get some delicious, healthy masculine as well. Um, And that's really the best places to find me where I play. I love Instagram. So if you want to come over and bump up our Wild Playground account, we are really starting to focus there. So Awesome. Come play with us. And it is really fun to play with Lola and Tigre. Like, 
I can attest that it has been such a blast. And just when she talks about a heart centered tribe, it's no joke. Nope. I mean, the the sisters in particular that I've met in Lola's tribe have become fast, fast soul sisters. So yeah, yeah. So we will put all of that information on the show notes for this episode over at honorthefeminine.com. So you can really easily click through as well to find Lola. Thank you so much. My love, thank you for today. That was so great. Thank you. I loved being with Lola today. She walks her authentic self. And it's it's so beautiful to watch her in motion and the way she shows up in the world. It's truly awe-inspiring. I also loved Tribal Attraction with Lola and her husband Tigre. And they are offering it again in November 2017. So I invite you to go over to wildplayground.com and check it out. Or you can go to the show notes for this episode at honorthefeminine.com and all the links are there and really easy. I also wanted to speak into Remembering Divine Union, an eight-month journey with Ava Aldenolfi and I that begins in November. It's it's, oh God, I'm so excited about it. Like I'm almost speechless. <laughs> That's how much excitement bubbles up in my body when I feel it. And the invitation is to come join us for an energy activation call where you will get a customized oracle card reading and an embodiment practice for just for you. So you can go over to rememberingdivineunion.com and schedule your energy activation call there. Finally, if you love this episode, please share it with a friend and subscribe because we have a lot of amazing episodes coming up. All right. Have a fabulous day. Mm